Hello and welcome to another episode of The Closing Track, the official podcast of Another Ascending Lark, where music and the Christian worldview collides with broken hearts, because nothing says Valentine's Day like writing a bunch of breakup songs and selling them to the masses to reap off of everyone's misfortune on the loneliest day of the year. Yeah. I mean, Grumpy Cat, I think, said it best, that uh, if you're... If you're on Valentine's Day and you're uh, mourning the fact that you don't have anyone to love you, just remember that nobody loves you any of the other days either. Exactly. Except for Jesus. But it yeah. would be creepy if that was a romantic type of love. Well, I have seen a lot of posts on Facebook of churches with something like, Jesus is always your Valentine. Are you his type of posts? <laughs> Why? And one thing, too, I find hilarious, I'm pretty sure that Single Ladies was played a lot this past <laughs> weekend, but keep in mind, as all the Single Ladies are dancing in circles and celebrating, yeah, Beyonce goes home to her husband every night. And then writes a song about their sex life called Drunken Love. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, so Valentine's Day was yesterday, and uh, Brett, you didn't do anything in particular, did you? Like, uh, go to Amp Card, but I do that all the time. Yeah, so. I mean, I went to I had breakfast with some friends, and then I went to Claude for most of the day, and came back home and watched Dragon Ball Z and worked out. And I mean, I, I mean, it really didn't even register with me yesterday that uh, yesterday was Valentine's Day, um, which I'm thankful for. Like, I I mean, I know so many friends who were. Uh, who were struggling through Valentine's Day and struggling through singleness when I'm at the point in my life where I'm just like, yeah, marriage is nice, but I kind of like being single. Yeah, and I still despise Valentine's Day, though. I mean, it takes what was the celebration of a man who was brutally martyred for his beliefs. <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> and instead, we celebrate his martyrdom by... Being by guys being forced to pay a lot of money to do something nice for girls, otherwise they're bad boyfriends, fiancés, or husbands. Right. Other otherwise they're they're just terrible men in general. I didn't spend any money on any girl, and I'm totally okay with that. And I just have to. I feel bad for the guys out there that are with girls who have birthdays close to Valentine's Day. Oh my Mag gosh! Yeah. Just imagine <laughs> if your girlfriend's birthday is February 13th. Oh, you have to man. do something big for that. And, and you have Valentine's to do something day. big for the next day. I mean, they're going to be completely broke by the end of that. Yikes. That's that's crazy. So advice for you guys out there. If you're interested in a girl and her birthday is close to Valentine's <laughs> Day, don't do it. Just just don't do it because, I mean, what more shallow of a reason could you not be interested in someone because of their birthday? That would be like the same thing with people whose birthdays are like near or around Christmas. Well, the thing, though, that I've noticed about Christmas if their birthday is close to Christmas, they just sort of graft it into Christmas. That's probably what these couples do. They probably just kind of graft it into, and it just kind of melted into one into another. And I mean, yeah, actu and actually, I would actually see that if if, if my girlfriend's slash wife's birthday was on, uh, I was on or near Valentine's Day, I would actually kind of see that as as a selling point, um, just because we could maybe collapse them into into one event. Yeah, and then, but I bet she wouldn't appreciate me saying that. Probably not. That, so I'll but have to edit that part out. Thankfully, my parents, their anniversary is like a week after Valentine's Day or something like that, and so they've never celebrated Valentine's Day oh, ever. Well, that's that's nice. And they literally knew each other ten months before they got married. So even when they were together, they didn't pass a Valentine's Day. That's they were fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, my name is Austin. I am the head honcho of Another Ascending Lark. I am the guy who uh, normally posts a bunch of Singles Days awareness stuff this time of year, but this year I don't think I actually did. And I'm Brett. I'm the editor over here, and today, or yesterday, I posted a Welcome to Night Vale post about how if you're lonely on Valentine's Day, just look in the background of the mirror. You are most certainly not alone. Well, that's kind of creepy. And then I also posted a picture, Love is in the Air, then Sheldon from Big Bang Theory covering his face with a shirt and spraying air freshener. That sounds about right. That that sounds about right for Sh for Sheldon. Yes. We got a great episode planned for you this week. Uh, we're taking a break from art and the Bible to uh, close the 2015 Grammy season up on our end. I promise we will not talk about the Grammys until later on in the year unless there is some earth-shattering, apocalypse-inducing uh, news with the Grammys in between now and be in 
you know, the time when the 2016 Grammys are announced at the end of this year. So this is it. This is the last episode we're doing on the Grammys for uh, for quite a while, and we won't talk about this again. I'm honestly quite tired of talking about the Grammys. I'm, I'm Grammied out. Um, so we're going to talk about the Grammys. We got probably the most uh, uh, another controversial review from us. I mean, we've done two back to back episodes yeah. where we've got some controversial reviews on the table. Um, and then we got some pretty uh, hilarious and facepalm inducing news. So, without further ado, let's dive into uh, let's just dive into to the first piece. Uh, Drake. Drake dropped a surprised album on Thursday night, and the the sales figures are already like projecting like half a million in sales, which that's just huge. Yeah, but. And honestly, if you think about it, if you're going to drop a surprise album, I think this is the time to do it. Yeah. Because, you know, Grammys are over. And, I mean, people's musical tastes are eclectic. They're not going to necessarily have already heard everything that's on the table. Right. But after the Grammys, going back, huh, this Bet guy won album of the year. I'm going to listen to it. Which I did this week. And so many other friends that we know. <laughs> And so, I mean, people probably have a desire for a bunch of new music right now just because they're seeking out all the songs that won Grammys. It's like it's like put, pre, putting refresh on the internet browser. Exactly. And then Drake comes along, drops this, everyone freaks out excitedly because <laughs> they're already wanting more music, and they go off through this album. Yeah, I mean, I was going to bed Thursday night, and I was laying in bed uh, reading my phone, and I saw... A bunch of the music sites that I follow go breaking news and says that Drake had put out an album. And I'm like, well, I've actually been having a hard time finding something to listen to this week. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to review Drake's album. And one thing I do have to applaud Drake on in this album, he used your properly in the album title. He did. I didn't even catch that. That's amazing. Well, of course I caught it. Well, yeah, because you're the editor. Yeah. And you're the, the grammar the grammar king of the house. Um yeah, so Drake dropped a new album. Uh, we listened, to, or I, I at least listened to it. You tried to listen to it a little bit of it, um, and we're gonna cover that later. Uh, but uh, Brett, what happened to uh, the guitarist from Killswitch Engage this week? I heard something really like legit happened to him. Yes, um, just so you know where I work at every um, day except for Friday, because Friday's movie day. We let the clients and us as staff watch The Price Is Right. Which I love the prices, right? Yes, and I'm watching this and I see some guy named Adam, and I'm like, okay, he looks really, really familiar. And he wins big. He wins two cars, wins some trips. He just barely got in on the last round of bidding. But I mean, he took it all home. I mean, he won hugely. He won gigantically. Then we're all online to clock out, which is our cue to get on our phones and check what we missed on the internet. <laughs> And I just see a bunch of stories. Adam D. from Kill Switch Engage wins big on The Price is Right today. And I'm just like, what? That's who that was. <laughs> it, was like, it was pretty epic. Yeah, so he, uh, I watched the video clip and he got like like the, the giant wheel thing that, yeah. that you spin. Like he just barely, uh, barely got in on that and won that. And then like they were bidding on, was it the truck that they were bidding on at the very end? I think it was the truck. Yeah, I think he bid with the um, one with the truck. And I, I think there were two trips in that showcase, too, but I can't remember what they were. Yeah, I don't remember the trips. All I remember was the vehicles. And, like, he beat the, the lady beside him. Uh, I think it was, like, a little under 150 bucks. Yeah. Like, I mean, it was, it was close. super, super close. And then the, the, the lady just walked off. I, I watched her face as she walked off, and she's just like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, I would be, too, if I were in her position. <laughs> Although, I have to say, if I were Adam D., I'd sell that yellow car, because that yellow color was not that good looking. I, don't know, I wouldn't sell it, but, I mean, I would definitely get it repainted yeah. because i mean i thought that i would actually keep the i would actually sell the truck and have kept the car okay fair enough because at least selling one would be a good idea to sort of make up for the massive amount no. of taxes you're gonna have to pay on all that yeah that's the thing is that people are like oh my gosh they're just like given this stuff well yes they're given the stuff and they're giving given a massive tax bill <laughs> yeah like that's just one thing when Oprah was big. You get a car, you get a car, everyone gets a car. What I picture saying, you get taxes, you get taxes, everybody, everybody gets, gets taxes. taxes. 
I mean, well, I mean, it's true because it's like they have to write this stuff off and somebody's got to put the, the tax bill for that. And so nobody wants to advertise that, oh, you just won this car and you also have to pay taxes on it. So um, it's like the dirty secret of game shows mm-hmm. that you have to pay a bunch of taxes. But yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. Good, good on good on him for for doing such a good job. Definitely. Um, Dave Grohl has been named the ambassador of the 2015 Record Store Day. Who? You're fired. Um, you know, he didn't play at the Grammys this year. I was really disappointed. He spoke, but he didn't play. Yeah. Which made me really sad. Um, yeah, so uh, Record Store Day this year is April 18th, uh, which I'm definitely, definitely excited for Record Store Day. This will be my this will be my second Record Store Day ever. Uh, I went to the first one. My first one was last year, and I managed to snag my probably my favorite piece of my massive vinyl collection, uh, Opeth's Watershed. And uh, I've since expanded my vinyl collection to a ridiculous amount, mostly through uh, uh, not paying for albums that I should pay for and getting them for dirt cheap when they're worth a lot more from customers. Um, but anyway, and so he is a, he's the official guy for a Record Store Day this year. It's not necessarily a big deal. I just thought it's Dave Grohl. People like Dave Grohl. Let's talk about Dave Grohl. Um, he writes, I believe that the power of Record Store... Is, that." I believe that the power of the record store to inspire is still alive and well, and with their importance to our next generation of musicians is, cr- is crucial. Um, and he's right. Like, records are coming back. People think it's a fad, but fads don't have five-year continuous growth periods. And while I'm not exactly the biggest fan of Jack White, what he did with Lazaretto... Was, that was amazing. Yeah, the fact that you can do something like... Back in the day when vinyl was like, the premiere and the best format there was, they couldn't have done the crap that he did with Lazaretto and have multiple different types of entries depending on where you put the needle. Right. No, and that was amazing. That was really, really freaking cool uh, that he did that. And, yeah, hopefully more more happens like that. Um, but, no, I figured, hmm, Dave Grohl. Let's talk about Dave Grohl. But now uh, it's time for the book, two of us to, pay, to facepalm uh, as we work through... YouTube's 10th anniversary. It's crazy to think that YouTube has been around now for 10 years. Yeah, it feels like it's been around longer for me, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I remember back when I was in middle school, uh, like, binge-watching anime, because I was a homeschool kid, uh, binge-watching anime on YouTube back when YouTube was just, like, getting started. So this would have been, like, 2005, 2006. Um, It's crazy just how big YouTube has, uh, has become such an integral part of our lives, which, for better or for worse... Um, can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. Yeah, because, I mean, if you think about it, a lot of times if you wanted to watch, back in the day, if you wanted to watch a music video, you either had to watch MTV or something like that or... MTV, what's that? I don't know. I mean... I think it used to be about music. I think it used to be, you know, actually about music. But I don't I mean, know what it is now. I mean, now with YouTube, people can just go, ooh, I want to see this new music video and they can just watch it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no, definitely. And so... The top 10 YouTube videos. You got that list pulled up? I do. Okay. So the first one, and this is no surprise, is Gangnam Style, which broke YouTube. We, we, we talked about this yeah. a couple weeks ago that it, like, broke the counter for YouTube. And so they had to, like, recode the, the, the view counter and make it even higher than what it is. Like, it's ridiculous. And then there's number two, which number two should be a crime against humanity. Yeah. Uh, Baby Nobody. by Justin Bieber. Yeah. Just just let that sink in. That the second most viewed YouTube video of all time is Justin Bieber. Yeah, I remember when he was number one and I face palmed forever and then Gangnam Cell won. I'm like, okay, I'm glad that there's something above Baby now. Well, and then the third option, or number three, is just as bad. <laughs> yeah. Number three is just as bad. Oh, and number four, too. Eh. Number four, uh, okay, whatever. But number three is a uh, party rock anthem by LMFAO, which we <sighs> nothing needs to be said on that. Yeah. Uh, number four, Dark Horse by Katy Perry. Uh, you know the song that ripped off Flame and and yeah. Lecrae. Um, I don't. I still don't think that it was a deliberate thing. I think it was an accidental thing. But I mean, the the riff that Flame like sued her for, like. As far as the intervals go, the intervals were matching yeah. perfectly. I so. mean, it's basically a slow... Dark Horse has basically a slowed-down version of 
um, joyful noises be. Yeah. And one thing, too, I have to say about this video. Have you seen the full video? I have not, and I don't really want to. <laughs> okay, because when Juicy J comes on and starts rapping, he looks so disgusting and so creepy. I'm just like, and he's like trying to seduce Katy Perry. He's just, I'm like, ew. Like, no, just, no, just stop. <laughs> yeah, it's Katy Perry. What do you expect? Yeah, yeah. it's got uh, eight. 819 million views, which is just ridiculous. Number five, finally, like something that's like a classic. Yeah. Um, Charlie bit my finger. Number five, uh, 811 million views. Like that's like one of the first YouTube videos yeah. like ever made was, was these two adorable little children and, and one of them is biting the other's finger. I mean, it, it's like a staple for the millennial age. Everybody knows this video. If you don't know this video, you're not from earth. Yeah, exactly. So, yay, finally. I mean, it's like the most adorable slash disturbing video of all time. Charlie bit me. And that really hurt. And then this baby just starts laughing menacingly. Yep. Precious moments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Put that on the next Precious Moments Precious Moments Bible, Charlie. Yes. <laughs> that moment when your baby bites your little kid's finger. Because that truly is a precious moment. Not for the kid, but for everybody else. Yes. Uh, number six, uh, I've never heard this song, Brett. You're more into Eminem than I am. Yeah, it's actually a really good song, I think. It's Love the Way You Lie, which I'm honestly surprised that it's up here, though, just because of how long ago it was made, and I didn't, I honestly didn't expect this many music videos to be on here. Yeah, that's the thing, is that, uh, I'm surprised that music videos are, like, like, dominating this list. I mean, there's so many other videos, uh, that you know, you would think might might occupy this list, but it's music videos, which is really, really, uh, really, really weird. Uh, Jennifer Lopez is number seven. Uh, how in the world is that possible? I don't know. <laughs> like, how in the world is a Jennifer Lopez song uh, featuring Pitbull? Uh, the title is On the Floor. How in the world is that at 809 million views? Probably just because of Pitbull. Yeah, probably just because it's Pitbull. And then even uh, number eight, uh, Shakira. Uh Waka Waka. I haven't heard that song in a long time. I'm just like, I don't remember the last time Jennifer Lopez and Shakira were honestly that relevant. Well, then again, we are like suburban white boys. And more like rural, I'd say. Rural white boys who listen to metal. So it would make sense that we, we scratch our heads at Jennifer Lopez and Shakira. Yeah. And then Katy Perry's back on the list again with her <laughs> ripoff song, Roar. I mean, not only is that a ripoff song, but it's just like, just read the lyrics. Every single line is a cliche. Yeah, especially the chorus. Like, I remember the first time I heard this song, I'm just like, this is popular? I'm just like, <laughs> and then like, I've, I've read a few reviews over it, and most reviews are saying, this song is full of cliches, this isn't good, but people eat it up. And then, again, I have to say this. She played this in the opening of this, her Super Bowl act mm -hmm. while riding on a tiger, and at the end, you're going to hear me roar. Oh my gosh, that was so lame. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, you're riding on a robotic looking tiger. Right. And you're screaming. Except that she wasn't screaming. She yeah. was like lip screaming. I'm just like, this, these are the theatrics of a heavy metal act. Which was. You cannot sing bubblegum pop music to that and it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it was it was even funnier because we were at a Super Bowl party with a bunch of metalheads, and yeah. we're all just like, "Oh, so Katy Perry can scream on stage, but we can't have Periphery or Dream Theater or Opeth or, you know." Okay, I mean, and granted, those bands are a little bit less known in the public theater, but I mean, come on, at least give us ACDC, Iron Maiden, something like that. Yeah, I mean, well, they're probably going to stay away from those guys just because you know they they had their brief little stint. Where they did like The Who and U2 and, you know, all these old rock bands and they just weren't quite as well. I mean, ACDC played at the Grammys and even though they played really well, those guys are also old. Yeah. <laughs> those guys are also really, really old. Well, then how about like David Crowder? I, That's never happening. I, I mean, that would be fascinating if that happened. I have no idea how, I have no idea what to even expect if David Crowder played at the Super Bowl. No, Okay. The one band, we need to get a petition started. 
theocracy for the Super Bowl next year. Okay, that's never going to happen. I know, but we need to get a petition started. That, that definitely would never would never happen. Um, number 10 is another one by Cy, Gentleman. Um, I guess people actually listen to Cy outside of, of Gangnam Style because, I mean, he's on here again. I mean, the only song from him that I know of is, is Gangnam Style. Well, I do remember, I can't remember the name of the song, but there was a song that people had heard, and they were like, oh, Boycott Cy, which just made him more popular, where he insulted America and, you know, our sort of bloodthirst for war and that sort of stuff. Oh my gosh, an artist insults America? Like, whatever shall we do? And I'm just like, okay, come on. What rappers do we have in America that have said more abrasive things than him? We have a lot. And I mean, like, we have to expect the world to, like, bow down to us and adore us because... And I mean, like when this one actually legitimately offended me when Soldier Boy <laughs> released his song oh that was basically, like... F the U.S. troops, and they saying that they think they're hard, but I'm the one who's really hard. That's what I'm just like, excuse me? After a week, everyone forgot about that. Yeah. I but mean, the whole Psy thing went on for months. Yeah, I mean, but he's he's an American rapper, so we can, we can forgive him, even though he's blatantly offensive. So, yeah, that's that's the state of our world. That's the top ten viewed videos on YouTube. And I... Well, okay, like the fifth one, I've definitely have watched plenty of times. Yes. Gangnam Style, I've seen once or twice. Other, and I can't, I don't think I've seen any of these other ones. So I, my, my hands are clean in regards to this list. I'm not responsible for well, this list. I've seen Dark Horse. I've seen clips of Baby on TV and it just made me facepalm. I know I've seen Love the Way You Lie. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, and then Charlie Bit My Finger and Gangnam Style, of course. Yeah, so let's let's get into reviews. So we talked about Drake uh, dropping a mixtape, uh, which it's surprising that it's a mixtape when it's for sale and you can buy it on iTunes and it got pulled from various mixtape sites. Um, he says it's a mixtape. People are, are confused by it, but it's called If You're Reading This, It's Too Late because that's an awesome, like, name for a surprise album title yeah um like that's a really really legit name for a surprise album title you were you, you tried to listen to a, a little bit of it but you couldn't get very far yeah i mean i listened to it and i did what i heard i did like i mean it did sound musically good but there were so many in bombs in there mm -hmm. i mean so many and i've i mean for a while back when i was in you know still living in clarendon we didn't get that many radio stations i listened to the hit station and so there were just to have some noise going on there were a lot of rap songs that featured the n-word of course bleeped out but right still i mean they weren't that prevalent but in this album i mean i was just like good grief can heard, you say something else like I, dude or bro i heard more in bombs on this album like in the in the couple of run-throughs that i put on this album then I probably have heard in my entire 23 years of my life prior like to this moment. That's not an overstatement. He's not exaggerating on that. No. Um, so this is definitely an interesting release, and this is probably the most challenging review that I think I've ever, I, I think I've done in quite a while. Um, I've been trying to like listen outside uh, my boundaries a little bit and try to get my hands on some some stuff that I'm not necessarily comfortable reviewing. And this is probably the most uncomfortable review I've done in a long time, um, just because it's Drake and just because it's modern hip hop and just because I don't know how to listen to hip hop outside of Lecrae, Shylin, Tadashi, you know, all them guys. Uh, I, I, I'm familiar with the Christian hip hop scene. But I'm not necessarily familiar with the the hip hop scene that's not the Christian market like, like this is. Um, so yeah, we talked about the language a little bit. Musically, this is really really good. Musically, this is this is awesome. If Which, this if this is released as a, just an instrumental with no lyrics, no no rapping whatsoever, if the songs on this track are put out in instrumental version, I'm totally buying it. Which is surprising because given a lot of Drake's previous releases he hasn't really been that good it's very minimalistic it's very atmospheric it's very um it's very contemplative and introspective which fits the the lyrical content of the album when he's not 
dropping F-bombs and, and N-bombs. Um, this is a very introspective and uh, sort of contemplative record, and he has a couple of statements in here that kind of shows that he's just kind of, he, he's reached this point now of fame and stardom, and uh, he's questioning some of the things that have come from that from that rise and from that fame and from that stardom, especially into the songs of uh, uh, Ten Bands and No Talent. Um, yeah, it, it's the the music fits the lyrics really, really well. The the integration of the content and uh, the way the content is presented is is pretty solid. And then the mastering, oh my gosh, the mastering on this album, oh my gosh, like if this if this gets nominated for a Grammy uh, for for like the best mastering project, like for the best uh, the best sound on a record, I'm voting for it. Like this, the mastering on this is phenomenal. It is probably one of the best mastered records I've ever heard. It may not be uh, the most. It's definitely not the most clean record ever, but it sure is the best sounding not clean record I think I've ever heard. Um, excuse me. Uh, Little Wayne, uh, Travis Scott, and Party Next Door have a couple of cameos, but other than that, it's just him. And uh, he, it's a very artistic record in that. Um, he has a lot of real weird left turns musically. Uh, the song Star 67 in particular has got some real f funny stuff in there. Um, none of these songs are radio friendly. None of these songs are radio primed. You're not going to hear any of these songs on the radio ever. Um, they're, they're very... Um, I mean, he released this. He released this not in the way that he's trying to necessarily get a lot of radio play. He just released it uh, just because he wanted to, and he's honest about. He's honest in this album. I gotta give him credit for that lyrically. He's very honest. He's very straightforward. He's very pissed off um, in this record, which is uh, a little bit uncomfortable to listen to at times. Like he drops quite a bit of uh, dirt on on a couple other rappers and a couple other other situations. He. Gives his thoughts in plenty of songs, like 6 p.m. in New York. He has a couple of lines about, uh, like, how we get so riled up about, like, things like Ferguson. Um, and we'll, you know, tweet about it, we'll talk about it, and then we'll forget about it in a couple of weeks. Um, he drops a couple of really, really funny references to The Matrix, to uh, Game of Thrones, to Home Alone. Um, I mean, there's a couple of lines in here that even though they might be saturated with language, the point that he's trying to make are actually really interesting points, which makes this a little bit more difficult to listen to because you have to separate the, the, what he's saying from how he's saying it, how he's saying it sucks. Like how he's saying it is pathetic, but what he's saying at, at times is really interesting, which again is surprising because Drake really hasn't been the deepest guy in his songs before. And I wouldn't say this is a deep album. Uh, I wouldn't even say this is a deep album. Like, I would say that the moments where it's deep and it's interesting are, are outnumbered by stereotypical rap subjects by like a five to one margin. But still, the fact that he did it at all is surprising to me. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely some interesting stuff lyrically in this album, but lyrically, as far as the way he writes his lyrics, it's terrible. It's garbage. Like, like there's it's the most racist thing I think I've ever heard, which, in full disclosure, I don't listen to hip-hop very much. I don't listen to rap very much. I asked a friend who who's into that scene. He said, this is normal. So, okay, whatever. Uh, but I mean, he, he can't write stuff without dropping in and F bombs, which I'm sorry. I don't care your background. That's just not good songwriting. Like I, I don't care your, your background. That's, that's not good songwriting. And we, we don't need to, we need to let that not slide. Um, he can write better stuff than this. Everybody can write better stuff than this. Um, the fact that uh, one thing I think the Christian sector doesn't get enough credit for is that they do manage to write um, some really creative lines without using language. And just imagine what Drake could do if he didn't if he expanded his vocabulary and picked up a couple of adjectives and adverbs and found ways to modify his words without the f bomb. Yeah. Um, so it was definitely a really in interesting, and I'm even going to say I enjoyed it in a couple of places. There are a couple of songs on here I really, really care for. Um, there, there are a couple of songs on here I just kind of was like, meh, over. But overall, like, it was challenging. It made me want to pull my hair out. There were a couple of places where I enjoyed it. I just wish that I didn't have to suffer through a 10 million F-bombs and 10 million N-words. In That's to, all? Well, yeah, it's probably more than that. Um in particular, the fifteenth track, uh, "You and the Six, is a song that he wrote to his mother. Which, I mean, that's not that's not in common end of itself. But I mean, it's his honesty, the the vulnerability on that track, and the things that he says 
um, while definitely not easy to listen to, uh, it's definitely um, the refreshing, the, the honesty of the album is very refreshing. The honesty of that song in particular is very refreshing. Um, he talks about forgiveness, uh, forgiving his dad in that track. He talks about um, kind of the loneliness of being up at the top in a couple of places and uh, his relationship with his mom. And I mean, it's an it's a difficult to listen to track, but it's really, uh, really gripping, really interesting, and the music for it is beautiful. So, I don't even know how to pin this. Like, I, I don't even really even know how to pin this, uh, just because this is something I've never really uh, listened to before, and I'm not, I don't have anything to compare it to, because, I mean, I could compare him to Lecrae, and that would result in some really interesting comparisons, but um, I, I really don't even know how to review it, which is, I enjoy the challenge. And I enjoy listening to something outside my comfort zone, but I don't really know how to review this. So if I were to pin this, I would pin this at a 6, um, maybe a 6.5, only because um, only because the songwriting is so poor that the mastering and the musical arrangements save this album from being garbage. But if you took the lyrics by themselves, the lyrics are garbage. The lyrics are trash. The lyrics have very little, they have some, but very little redemptive quality in any way, shape, or form. It's mostly garbage as, as far as the lyrics go, but the music is incredible. The mastering is incredible. So I'm going to put this at a 6.5. And uh, if, you wanna, if you disagree with me, if you think that I'm wrong for doing that, just send me an email and blow my head off with your... With, with, whatever you want to blow me off with, but 6.5. Drake's, if you're reading this, it's too late. 6.5 out of 10. You know they have the clean version on Rhapsody, right? Did not know that, but generally speaking, as much as, I, I mean, I definitely don't approve of massive amounts of cursing in songs, but as much as I don't like that, I'm I'm kind of against clean edited records. I am as well, and I'm against them not because... Uh, Here's why I'm against them. I'm against them because at least like within our circle, like the Christian circle, there's like this this false justification of like, oh, well, I listen to the clean version of this song, so it's okay. When, no, if if we as Christians should not expose ourselves to, filthy lang- to songs with filthy language, and I would agree with that you know, on principle, um, our minds are smart, and we can fill in the blanks. Yeah, we know what they're saying. <laughs> we also, know what they're saying. <laughs> and also, a lot of times in these songs, I mean, they just edit out cuss words, but what they're saying is still, they're like, I smack my across the face. I mean, you know what they said. Right, and so, I mean, if you're going to... I'm against clean versions as well on a couple of instances. If it's a mild thing, uh, if it's a, like, a mild thing, like I have Coed and Cambria's... Um, uh, oh, gosh... I can't remember the name of the album. It's uh, the fourth one. It's there. It's the one that's got Welcome Home on it. Wow, I'm ashamed that I can't remember this. Um, um, something about Apollo. Yeah. Uh, it's a, I'm it's burning, like a I'm, paragraph of a title. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Let me look it up on my phone. I'm so embarrassed right now that but I would forget he's, one of my favorite bands. While he's looking it up, another main reason that I'm against clean records is because it pulls you away from the song. I mean, it mm-hmm. distracts you. It takes, it cuts a piece of it out. And honestly, I pay more attention to those words when they're like Bew, or beep or just not there at all. Right. It, it, by, by taking the language out, it actually draws you to the language more than if it had just been there. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm definitely, if you want to listen to it clean, like I'm not saying it's wrong to listen to it clean, um, but just, my personal stance and your personal stance too is just that if you're going to listen to a record that has language, don't try to, uh, don't try to like justify yourself by, uh, thinking that, Oh, well I just listened to the clean version. It's okay. No, don't be stupid. You know what you, you know that you put those words together in your mind. You know that you think about those words. And so if the point is to avoid the language, you're not avoiding the language by listening to the clean version. If anything, you're drawing attention to it. Exactly. Um, and, I mean, we can talk about, and this would actually be a good episode sometime, uh, to talk about, like, should Christians listen to albums that have the explicit label on it? I mean, I was uncomfortable listening to this. I mean, I was really uncomfortable listening to this. But at the same time, I mean, you have to think more than just the explicit content label. One example, one band I really like, My Chemical Romance. Mm-hmm. 
all of their albums except their first one has an explicit content label on it, but their first album has more language than any of their other albums combined. Isn't it funny how things get the explicit label when uh, when they shouldn't? I mean, I have a, a Church's, Church's uh, album, The Mother We Share, um, or no, The Bones We Believe In, and uh, yeah, it's got the explicit label on it, but I mean, there's only like two or three F-bombs on the whole entire album. I mean, it's, and they're, and they're mild usages of the, of the F-bomb. They're not uh, the the worst or worser extent of that word. And then the last album that My Chemical Romance released, can't remember the full title of it. It's another paragraph, but it's something, something, The Life of the Fabulous Killjoys. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, yeah, there were like a couple F-bombs in there, but I'm just like, this isn't bad. I mean, there's not much content that's really that bad in here. When the F-bombs are used, they're not, they're like replacing messed up and that sort of stuff. Okay, so like Mumford and Sons. Yeah. Like you remember when, when Mumford and Sons' first album came out and there was this giant debate about like Little Lion Man. Yeah. And it's I mean, just like, I'm just like, really, we're going to have a debate about this, but we're going to let rap get a pass? And another thing you have to realize, Mumford and Sons is British. The language used in Britain isn't seen as vulgar as we see it. Mm -hmm. And plus, like, if you were to substitute the F-bomb in that song, what would be the synonyms for it? Messed up. I really messed it up this time. Yeah, I really messed it up this time. I really screwed it up this time. So, yeah, we'll definitely have to revisit the subject at some point in time. Uh, Just because I think it's something we need to talk about. And, And don't misunderstand me. Like, even though I gave... A, a 6.5, which is a decent grade on this album. I am not giving any stamp of approval of any way, shape, or form to, to the language. Uh, don't don't misunderstand me. The language here is, is terrible. The language here is bad. I have nothing praiseworthy to say about the, lyric, the, the language used in Drake's album. There's not a redeeming use for it. It is totally unnecessary. It is totally vulgar and totally inappropriate. So don't, don't think that I'm giving a pass on, uh, on Drake here and the language of this album. Good Apollo, I'm Burning Star 4. That was the name of the Coheed and Cambria album. I can't okay. believe I forgot that. When Coheed and Cambria is one of my favorite bands, how in the world did I forget that? Well, they have like 5,000 albums and all of them are paragraphs. So, <laughs> yeah. I can't wait for Coheed and Cambria to put out a new album. But speaking of new album, what's coming out this week? This week we have what I will be reviewing, Imagine Dragons Smoke and Mirrors, which apparently already has some pretty bad... There's been reviews. a couple. There's been a couple of reviews, <clears throat> early reviews that are popping up that are not very, uh, not very good. But that doesn't weigh anything with us. Like, I yeah, mean, we'll we're, see. We're we're just like, psh, we'll just we'll say whatever we want about the album. Uh, yeah, you'll probably take it on the show. I'll probably crank out a written review of it uh, some point in time in the middle of the week, and you can talk about it on on the show next week. That that's mean, assuming that's assuming it comes out on Rhapsody, which I yeah. hope it does. <laughs> then we also have a bunch of other stuff coming out. This will definitely be a better week than last week was. Yeah, I mean, I'm just waiting for the 24th when Red's album comes out. That's one of the first big releases that I'm excited to cover. Um, but I'm definitely thankful. Uh, I'm definitely thankful that I was able to cover something and that uh, it was something outside my comfort zone. So, all right, so let's get into the Grammys. Uh, let's let's get into fun with the Grammys. So we're taking a break from Art in the Bible. Uh, We'll be back with that next week. Uh, This week we wanted to kind of get a little bit more informal and loose than uh, what we've been in the past couple of episodes. Like I, I've, I send Brett these these uh, massive outlines Saturday afternoon, like for the past couple of weeks, with like these gigantic like lectures for art in the Bible. Yeah. Um, and this week the the uh, the main course is like, or the the notes for the main course is like practically non-existent. So uh, it'll be a little bit more informal. We had a Grammy watching party here uh, a week ago. We had seven or eight people over in, yeah. our, in our tiny little apartment. Uh, I made homemade pizza. We had a lot of craft beer, which we still have a lot of craft beer. Um, and yeah, it's ours now. Yeah, it's ours now. It was a great time. Like I, I had a blast. I, have, I can't wait to do it again next year. Um, so we're just going to talk about uh, our favorite parts of the night, our least favorite parts of the night, winners. And then at the end, we're going to talk about Kanye West because you can't talk about the Grammys and not talk about Kanye West. Even though he didn't get nominated for anything. Even though he had no reason to be there. So, what were what were your favorite parts of, of the Grammys last week? Like, what were your favorite parts about it? Well, definitely ACDC oh, yeah. was a plus in there. And honestly, every single time that Iggy Azalea and Megan Trainor didn't win something, <laughs> I threw my fist in the air in celebration. 
yeah, you were looking at me, I think, every time Megan Trainer got nominated, and I'm just like, what? <laughs> like, just because I reviewed her doesn't mean I want her to win. And then, uh, I can't remember, what was the name of that one girl who got nominated for Best New Artist who was a country singer? Country singer? Oh, mom, 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 yeah, I know who you're talking about. Let me pull it up. I'm just, let me find it. It's here. I have it in here somewhere. Best right. new, uh, Brandy Clark. Yeah. Anyway, she did a duet with another country singer, and they did an actual real country song, not Miranda, the whole, Not like, Miranda Lambert's. Yeah, not <laughs> pop music with a country twang, and while I generally don't like country that much, that was actually that really song, good. That song was amazing. And also another surprising moment... Lady Gaga and Tony Bennett. That was incredible. I was like, uh, Lady Gaga. And I'm like, uh, Tony Bennett, why are you bringing yourself down to this? But then I heard it. I'm like, oh, wow. It, it's a, it's really sad because Lady Gaga destroyed that song. Like, blew it out of the park. Yeah. Why in the world is she not doing that all the time? I mean, dang, I would listen to Lady Gaga if she started doing that. Well, she, had it, well she put out an album with him. Yeah, uh, which I year. definitely need to listen to yeah, now. Yeah, we didn't cover that, but I mean, uh, I mean, I saw that it came out. I didn't want to cover it just because it was Lady Gaga, but then I saw her perform with, with Tony Bennett, and I'm just like, oh my gosh. And then at first, um, when Pharrell came on and did that oh weird God. intro to Happy, I'm like, what the heck is happening? Then it actually started picking up, I'm like... Okay, good. You're not doing the entire song like all, this. All of our musician friends were like, you can't play happy in a minor key. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then the last song, while... I mean, they the last song with John Legend in common, mm -hmm. they sort of alluded to the gospel, but it was in a very watered-down way, and it I was sort of a thing to justify civil rights sort of stuff, and a lot of the civil rights stuff I'm hearing, I'm like... And we're kind of past a lot of this. You know, I was saying anything profound and the things he was saying that was new. I'm like, we need to stop talking about this and have legitimate, intelligent speakings about this. But the song itself was good. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. My favorite parts uh, were, were ACDC, like you said. Um, Lady Gaga was really good. Um, Sam Smith. Sam Smith did a, did a really good job. Um, oh, gosh. Um Beck and Ed Sheeran. Beck and Ed Sheeran's Oh, performance. yes. How did I forget those? But yeah, yeah it, those were great. And then this this particular performance got panned by every uh, every article from everything that I read this past week. But um, Adam Levine and, and Gwen Stefani, like, nobody liked that performance. Mm. I thought it was great. Uh, I mean, I liked it okay, but I didn't think it was that great. I thought it was... I mean, it's the. I think it was the best thing that I've personally have heard from them, which isn't much, but I mean, yeah. I liked it. Um, gosh, what else? Well, one uh, thing at least that was kind of surprising to me is Kanye's solo solo performance oh was actually decent. It was actually enjoyable, except for the fact that he he was like so auto tuned. It was like I mean annoying. <laughs> and the lyrical content, though, I mean, was actually getting kind of deep. I mean, he's singing about his kid, and I'm like, I've. I would have never expected this from Kanye. The visuals for that performance too were really cool, like him standing over this light and like working around like this this floor light. I thought that was actually really neat. Yeah, going into negatives though, Madonna. Oh my performance. gosh, that was like she had a bunch of Minotaur slash Kunari people dancing around, and then she's like just sitting there spreading her legs multiple times. And then um, I mean, she has to incorporate a strip tease because it's Madonna. She doesn't have much to do except take her clothes off. I just pictured her family sitting at home or sitting in the audience watching this, going, "Grandma, what are you doing?" <laughs> That's terrible. Like she's like what in her sixties? She's pretty dang old. I mean, a sixty-year-old woman doesn't need to be doing. No woman needs to be doing that, but especially yeah. not a sixty-year-old woman. Yeah, I mean, I, I tweeted. I tweeted because I was live tweeting during that. I tweeted. I'm like. Uh, Madonna, once again, reminding us that if you have to sell your sexuality to get people to pay attention to you, your talent is legitimately in question. Yeah. And then another thing, which surprisingly, a lot of my Facebook friends, like this was the only good performance to them. Beyonce's performance kind of was meh to me. I mean, that was actually the only performance that I've seen of Beyonce that I was actually impressed with, mainly because it was a uh, mainly because her vocal control in that particular song was uh, was pretty technical. Uh, she wasn't she she had to have some real strong vocal control on her on her singing to make that song work. Was it visually, you know, it wasn't the Super Bowl for yeah. sure, for sure. Um, but it wasn't 
that was the only performance I think I've seen of Beyonce that I actually liked. The main thing that sort of ticked me off about this whole thing is the introduction to the song was very multicultural. People of all races sing this, you know, it's something that's pervaded in all religions everywhere. Yeah. And it's all religions. I'm like, find me a religion that has sung a Christian hymn. Yeah. And then at the same time you see it and it's Beyonce and a bunch of black guys. I'm like, what's multicultural about this? Yeah. I mean, it, it was definitely a weak moment for the Grammys and I don't, and it was definitely an oversight that I think they should have corrected on because you're, you're right. There weren't any Asians, there weren't any, uh, any Hispanics. I mean, there was a there was a really good opportunity, I think, to display a really good moment of multiculturalism, but I don't think they I mean, they executed it well. All they would have had to do is, I mean, the guys in the background didn't really do anything except sort of interpretive dance motions while kind of looking like angel wings behind mm-hmm. Beyonce. So I mean, you could have easily put in multiple races behind her, and that would have been really cool. That would have been yeah, that would have been really really cool. Um, oh gosh, what's what's the name of the lady that performed with Hosier? Uh, uh, Annie, uh, um, um, she's the lead singer of the Eurythmics. Uh, I'm forgetting, but Hosier had an amazing performance of take me to church. And then this other old lady comes on and destroys it. Yeah. Like ruins it. Uh, that was a, that was a sucky moment. Um, there were several really, really good performances. I, said, I think overall this year, like I enjoyed the Grammys more this year than I think I've had in the past couple of years. Yeah, because this time, I mean, it seemed like people were actually more legitimately interested in artistic ventures than just straight up popular Sia. songs. Uh, Sia. With, Sia. Yeah, Sia. Sia. My bad. Uh, with Elastic Heart, uh, that was phenomenal. That yeah. was out. The dancing for the the dancing that they did for that song was that was incredible. Yeah, and while a lot of me, I'm just like, are they? Is she even singing? This just sounds like they're playing a song. But the same, like at first, I'm just like, uh, come on. But then, watching all the dancing and the, the story, the dancing t- um, told, I'm just like, oh, this is great. really good. Like it was. I mean, I went to work the next day, and my coworkers were like, that that performance was pedophilia. And I'm just like, no, it wasn't. Like, no, that's that's a ridiculous, ridiculous assertion. Like. It was it was extremely talented. It was graceful. It was beautiful. It wasn't it wasn't sexual in any way. Not at all. Like it, it was not sexual in any way, shape, or form. I mean, a lot of me when I'm thinking about this performance and the actual music video for Chandelier, I'm just like, this is sort of seems to be bringing back the lost art of like fine dancing, like ballet. I mm-hmm. mean, yeah, if, it was very ballet. Uh, the, the dancing was very ballet reminiscent. It, it was. I mean, I'm just like, this is good that we're at least partially getting back to this because ballet is good and it's not twerking i mean yeah. she could have done just a song i mean there wasn't any twerking at the grammys this year thankfully amazing that's phenomenal <laughs> that's really really phenomenal i just didn't i didn't realize that until now um and then um gosh there was another one i can't think of but i'm sure it'll come back to me in a second let's get into the winners and the losers and let's get into uh <laughs> let's get into the winners and the losers so record of the year uh Category number one was uh, Stay With Me, the Dark Child version. Uh, Sam Smith took home a lot. You mean Tom Petty took home a lot? <laughs> yeah. One of our friends that was watching uh, was like, this is a Tom Petty ripoff. <laughs> like, Which, I mean, Sam Smith does have to pay royalties to Tom Petty now due to a lawsuit. Yep, yep, he sure does. Um, and what was the name of that song from Tom Petty that um, Stay With Me ripped off of? I can't remember, but... Um, like he seemed to be like Tom Petty seemed to be okay with it. Like he didn't think it was a legitimately like I'm deliberately trying to rip off Tom Petty moment. Yeah. Like it was just an accident. So yeah, he's gonna get royalties from it. But he he was he was pretty cool with it, which I really admire that because I don't think Sam Smith. I don't know. I I want to say Sam Smith didn't intentionally rip off Tom Petty, but I mean it, it was. I mean the tempo. The, the notes, everything was exactly like the chorus on that Tom Petty song, though. Yeah, I know, but there are some performances where it just seems, uh, where it just seems that there's a little bit more deliberately ripping off going on. And this performance, I just don't, I just have a hard time believing that. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, category number two, album of the year, <laughs> the most controversial award of the night, uh, went to Beck for Morning Phase. Which we were all sitting there, like all sitting here, like watching, and we were just 
you know, bracing for the impact of Beyonce getting that award. Cause like yeah. Beyonce was like the shoe in for that award. And then we hear Beck like get the award and, and we're just like, Oh, we're just like, Oh my gosh. Which I'm pretty sure are at that moment, our neighbors were very mad at us unless they too were watching the Grammys. Then they would have known exactly what the noise was about. I, I doubt it. But I mean, that was a pretty, uh, that was a very significant upset. Um, because Beyonce was like, she everybody was ex- just expecting her to to shoe in that victory, mm-hmm. um, but she didn't get it. And not only did she not get it, uh, Beck's morning phase did not sell very well. Yeah, I mean it did not sell all. It did not sell even remotely as well as the other nominees on this list. And but, I mean, I personally, I had never heard of Beck until the Grammy Awards list came out. I have. And I have some of his older stuff, but I hadn't. I hadn't gotten a hold of Morning Phase. And I guarantee you that a lot of people watching hadn't heard of Beck before. So this, I mean, and Beyonce's. I mean, she's been big since the '90s with Destiny's Child. Uh-huh. I mean, Beyonce is a superstar, right? In it's, every meaning of that word, she is a superstar. Yeah, they call her Queen Bey for a reason. And then, which I mean, she is a talented musician. I have to give her that. She really is talented. But when Beck comes along with a, a rock album in this day and age and wins album of the year. it That moment restored my faith in the Grammys that the Grammys are not just a popularity contest. Which I mean, maybe there's starting to be a shift because like you were saying and like I agree with, this is the first Grammys in a long time that wasn't thoroughly disappointing. No, like this wasn't disappointing at all. This was a very, I enjoyed it this yeah. time. Last year, last year I didn't enjoy it. Last year I was pulling my hair out more than anything. Um, but this time, like, it was it was good. And I think, like, the fact that Beck got it, the fact that an album that didn't sell very well from an artist that's not quite on the public conscience like Beyonce is, I, I think showed that the Grammys this time around weren't quite as interested in popularity contests. Because if it was a popularity contest, Beyonce would have gotten that award. Definitely. Like, no, no contest, Beyonce would have gotten that award. And instead, the underdog got it. And I would say that the underdog is better than Beyonce because uh, he played every single instrument on that album. He produced that album himself. He recorded that album himself. Uh, Beyonce had, I think the numbers, like in the mid-60s or in, in order to get that album done. Mm-hmm. As far as songwriters and producers and engineers, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, um, but the fact that one person could make such a killer album, I think, speaks more definitely to to talent and creativity. Um, song of the year, stay with me. Uh, of be, course. Well, it'd be all about that bass, which I'm sure you were really uh, and shake it off. And I was really happy about both of those that it beat it. Best new artist, Sam Smith. Sam Smith almost pulled an Adele. Like he almost took home. I mean, he took home four. If he had been, if he had won the other nominations that he had been in, he would have pulled off an Adele and taken home six. Yeah, although I was pulling for Bastille in that oh, yeah. category, though. Oh, yeah, but was... again, I'm just glad that Iggy Azalea didn't win. <laughs> right. Oh, I'm so glad Iggy Azalea didn't win. I'm glad she didn't perform either. Yes, definitely. Um, that would have been probably the lowest point of the night. Um, best pop performance, Happy. Which, while I'm like, okay, Happy, while a lot of my friends disagree, I think Happy is a good song. I was definitely pulling for all of me. Yeah, I was pulling for all of me as well, but it's okay. I'm, I was fine with Happy. Uh, best pop vocal album, In the Lonely Hour. Not a surprise there. That one was That one was going to win. Um, category number 12, let's find category number 12, best rock performance, Jack White, Lazaretta, which yeah. that's, that was, that was right. That was a, that was a good pick. Um, <laughs> best metal performance, Urgh. best metal performance. I, I, what a joke. What a terrible joke. Friggin tenacious D with a Ronnie James Dio cover. This is equivalent to Weird Al Yankovic winning an award for uh, Amish Paradise, like yeah. in, in the rap category, like if Weird Al, Weird Al had won a Grammy for Amish Paradise in the rap category, this is the same thing. This is a comedy band winning a Grammy for a metal cover. This isn't even their song. It's a Ronnie James Dio song. And actually, two of the nominations were Ronnie James Dio songs. One of them Tenacious D. One of them Anthrax. The only solid nomination on here, and this even this song isn't even the song I would have nominated from this album. Uh, but Mastodon's High Road. Well, the negative one by Slipknot was a really good song too. But I mean, the metal nominations this year were just pathetic. Like it, yeah, it was. This is a disgrace. I mean, 
why are covers even eligible for nomination in this category? I don't think they should be at all because that's not their song. I'm and not, they admit it's not our song. I'm not against covers in principle, but I think that if it's going to be nominated, it's got to be a really exceptional case. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, it's, this is a tribute album. This is this is a tribute album that uh, Anthrax and Tenacious D got nominated for. We have releases from Opeth. We had releases from The Contortionist. We had releases from Between the Buried and Me. We had releases from a bunch of amazing metal this musicians. Was a, 2014 was a great year for metal. Yeah, we had nominations from it. We had Anubis Gate. I yes. Mean, I mean, that would have that deserved a Grammy. Um, but instead, the, the people at the Grammys pick Anthrax. Anthrax hasn't been on the public metal scene for a long time. I forgot that Anthrax <laughs> is even still around. Right? I mean, there was a really good op-ed that came out a couple of days before the Grammys about, like, things that the Grammys needs to improve. And one of the things that it said, like, the biggest present shame on the Grammys is the fact that the metal performances are such a joke. Like, the, the, the nominations are such a joke. Um, best Rock Song, number 14, Ain't It Fun by, by Paramore. This isn't a rock song. <laughs> it's not at all. I mean, I love this song, and I love that album, but that's not a rock song. It, it, it's not. I mean, I would have much rather have seen um, Black Keys and uh, Lazaretto win that, that award. And then number 15. Number 15, I had wished it had gone to you 2 but I, I'm okay with Beck getting that award. Yeah, me, it makes sense to me. If it wins Album of the Year, it should win Rock Album of the Year. Fair point. Uh, number 16, Best Alternative Music Album, St. Vincent got that award. I'm so happy that that was, was nominated. We played St. Vincent a lot when I was uh, when I was doing stuff on FM90. She's weird and she's very eclectic, but I love her sound. She is, she is an amazingly talented pop artist. And then number 17, that was no surprise at all. Drunk in Love by Beyonce with Jay-Z. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no no comment. Let's skip down to uh, to 22 on this really ridiculous list. Uh, best rap performance. Uh, Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar uh, got that over uh, Lecrae, which, I mean, that's fine. I mean, that was... I'm thankful that Lecrae was nominated, but I didn't expect Lecrae to win in that category. Yeah. Uh, 22, let's go down to 25. Best rap album. Uh, Marshall, the Marshall Mathers LP2 by Eminem, which, okay, you know. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really listen to much in the rap category. I mean, and really, a, the only other album I've probably been okay with would have been Nobody Smiling by Common. Yeah. But again, I'm just happy that Iggy Azalea didn't win. I think that's the theme of this year, Grammys. As long as Iggy Azalea doesn't win, we don't care. Exactly. Um, and then <sighs> the stuff in between all that, and let's find 37, because that's when the Christian categories get, start getting... So, Best Contemporary Christian Music Performance Song. Lecrae with Messengers. Uh, okay. Like, I mean, I still wish that there had been a different album or a different song nominated off that album, but I was okay with with that particular song. And it was one, a solid closing track. One thing, too, that kind of takes me off is a lot of people are like, oh, Lecrae says he doesn't want to be known as a gospel rapper, but he got a Grammy for gospel song. What's like, the guy supposed to do? I mean, he didn't pick that. And when you win a Grammy, you don't just sit there, eh, no thanks. Right. I mean, it's like, Gungor got nominated for Best Contemporary Christian Music Album, and I know Gungor did not want to get nominated for those for, for that several years ago. I mean, what, what is it, what's the guy supposed to do? Like, you're nominated for the biggest award in music. What, are you not going to take it? Like, I mean, and while this definitely shows that he hasn't fully branched out because he didn't win a quote-unquote secular category, I mean... Lecrae's getting attention. He was nominated for a secular category. Yeah, he was nominated, and I mean, he's getting attention. Yeah, which is good. And next year, I mean, if the at the rate Lecrae has been pumping out good albums, maybe he'll win something in a secular category. Maybe he'll even have a performance on the Grammys, which that would be awesome. I can't wait for the day he does. That would draw in a crap ton of viewers because this year it's interesting enough that that this year. Uh, was I think one of the best Grammys in recent years, but it has the lowest attendance, like the lowest viewership since like mid two thousands. Yeah, uh, it had like twenty five million viewers, which is pretty low for the Grammys, uh, but yet it was one of the best ones. Um, best contemporary Christian music album: uh, Run the Wild, Live Free, Love Strong for King and Country. No complaints. That's what I wanted to win. That's what deserved to win. That's a, that was a that was the best pick of the bunch, and I'm glad that that one got it because that was a really solid pop album. Number 40. Uh, 
Number forty, I only mentioned because one of our one of the one of our fans pointed out that uh, pointed out Mike Ferris to me, and uh, I heard some stuff from him the other day, and I, I'm disappointed that I haven't heard of this guy prior because he's freaking brilliant. Uh, his name is Mike Ferris. The album was Shine for All the People, and uh, if you're into jazz, if you're into blues, if you're into roots rock, hey, check him out. Like. Just, just do it. And I'm honestly surprised too to see that Gaither vocal band was even on this list. Like the Gaithers are still doing stuff. Gaithers are still the Gaithers are still alive and kicking. Amazingly enough. And their main fan base is a bunch of old people. Right. Uh, <clears throat> the last one that I think we'll we'll mention, and then we'll, we'll get into com- to Kanye, uh, is best comedy album, Mandatory Fun by Weird Al. Totally deserved. Of to win. course. We didn't cover that album last year. Which we should have. Because Wasn't that released in the summer? Yeah. During the hiatus? Yeah, but I mean... Yeah, one of us should have picked it up as a rewind. Yeah, I mean, one of us should have picked it up as a rewind. And I've listened to that album quite a bit. I can't believe I didn't cover that. But it was a great record. Totally, totally deserved a win. Um, and then Frozen and Let It Go won a couple of Grammys, which was, which was nice. Um, definitely happy for that. Yeah, I'm definitely happy for it as well. Uh, so, overall, would you say that you were satisfied with who won and who didn't? Definitely. I, I would too. Overall. Although one thing, I can't believe you didn't mention this earlier, but one thing that really disappointed me in the Grammys is I was actually kind of excited for the performance with Rihanna, Kanye West, and Paul McCartney oh, just because yeah. Paul McCartney That's was there. That's what I was there. forgetting. But freaking Paul McCartney's microphone, it was like it wasn't even turned on. Yeah. I mean, we could mildly hear his acoustic guitar. But we couldn't hear his voice at all. I'm like, I don't want to listen to Kanye West and Rihanna. I want to hear... The Beatle. Yes, I want to hear Paul McCartney. You want to hear The Beatle. <laughs> the, the last, like, surviving public... Surviving in the public eye Beatle. <laughs> this, the, the instance where he's, like, dancing to... Uh, who was that that was playing and Paul McCartney was dancing to it? I can't remember. Well, I he wasn't remember. dancing to it. He was just standing up and sort of He clapping. was the only one, like, who was getting yeah. into that song. And then... And he then <laughs> He, like, noticed that no one else is around and shrugs at the camera and then sits back down. Right. And then after that, everyone stands up. Right. It was, it was really funny. But I would say that overall I was satisfied with the, the awards this year. The, the medal category aside, that was a joke. That was an abomination. Uh, I was satisfied with with the awards this year. Um, but we, we, we can't not talk about uh, Kanye West and, and Beck. Yeah. Um, you want to read... Kanye's remarks after the show, and we'll we'll talk about them and sure. Break and then this I'll down. have to brush my teeth after the show just because of the dirtiness I'm about to speak. <laughs> <laughs> now, just for some background, when Beck showed up, Kanye walked onto the stage like he was going to say something reminiscent of his thing with Taylor Swift, and then backed off. And Beck's like, "Hey, come back! What's going on?" And everyone laughed, thinking that Kanye was joking right. and making light of because everyone got the reference but afterwards he was interviewed and he no, wasn't he wasn't kidding yeah he was completely serious and the interview said was um the grammys if they want real artists to keep coming back they need to stop playing with us we ain't gonna play with them no more flawless beyonce's video beck needs to respect artists and he should have given his award to beyonce and at this point we're tired of it because what happens is when you keep on diminishing art and not respecting the craft and smacking people in their face after they delivered monumental feats of music, you're disrespectful to inspiration. We as musicians have to inspire people who go to work every day and they listen to that Beyonce album and they feel like it takes them to another place. Then they, the show's producers, do this whole promotional event. They'll run the music over someone's speech, the artist, because they want commercial advertising. Like, no, we're not playing with them no more. By the way, I got my wife, my daughter, and my clothing line, so I'm not going to do nothing to put my daughter at risk. But I'm here to fight for creativity. That's the reason I didn't say anything tonight. But you all know what it meant when Ye walks on the stage. So aside from the fact that this is like hypocrisy 101, um, yeah. I'm sorry when Ye walks on the stage. Yeah, it's okay. But uh, if the Grammys, if they want real artists to keep coming back, they need to stop playing with us. Which th- this what is, does that even mean? <laughs> I don't know, because, I mean, like we were saying, this is the first Grammys in a while that they got the real artists on the stage. And this was the first Grammys in a long time where, uh, well, I mean, the Grammys have a reputation for not honoring good artists. Like, yeah. That, like, that, that's a reputation they already have. And I was have to say, I mean, 
Well, like I said earlier, Beyonce is a good, I mean, she's a really good singer songwriter, but what is with she this? She actually doesn't write her own songs. Okay. She's a good <laughs> singer. But what is with this worship that Kanye has for Beyonce? Well, what is this worship with the whole like music internet community has with us? Like people, like yeah. I was amazed at how many articles popped up, like in defense of Kanye's statements and like in defense of the fact that Beyonce got snubbed for this award. Like it, it baffles me because I'm like, what, what, why, did, where is this love affair with Beyonce coming from where if she doesn't win, it's racist? And, and again, with the Super Bowl performance, everyone worshiped that performance and tried to justify every little problem with it. I'm like, just say it wasn't a good performance. Just say it. Right. Because it wasn't. It's, and it's, he says, he says, go on. Beck needs to respect artistry and he should have given his award to Beyonce. No, no, no. one's going to do that. No. Like that's that is so insulting. Like that that is so terribly insulting. I mean, okay, let's just picture if Beck gets on the I don't deserve this, here you go, Beyonce. That slaps everyone on the committee who voted for him to win the Grammy in the face. That's insulting to Beyonce because she's just being conceded the award. Right. And not only that, I mean, he's been nominated for Album of the Year multiple times and has never got it. So this yeah. is the first time I think he's gotten album of the year. And also I remember it's not quoted here, but he was Kanye was asked if he had even heard of Beck before. He's like, no, nah, come on, I know Beck, he's good, you know, something like that. But Beyonce, she'll still should have win. But the way he said it, I have to wonder, did he really know who Beck was before this? I mean, he might have known Beck in like name only. I don't know. But it's so hypocritical because he's telling Beck that he needs to respect artistry when he himself is disrespecting artistry. Is disrespecting artistry. I mean, again, Beck played every instrument on that album. He recorded and produced that album himself. He wrote every single song on that album. Beyonce didn't. <laughs> Beyonce didn't. Didn't write. I don't think she wrote any of her songs by herself on that album, if at all. I mean, she doesn't write her stuff. So, it, it I think, here's, here's an hypothesis, and you can tell me what you think of this. I think that this is a clash between um, musicianship versus performing, where you have a performer, like Beyonce, who's not necessarily a musician, but is a performer, clashing with a musician who has, you know, can play instruments and write songs on those instruments. Yeah, I can see that, but I think maybe the main thing is probably styles because i mean now we live in the age of hip-hop and r&b and that sort of stuff rock has sort of fallen away from the 80s right and i mean with this i'm hoping that maybe rock is starting to make a comeback but you have to also think about what kanye said before that rap is the new rock that the rap stars are the rock stars now and that he's the biggest one maybe he's feeling threatened by the fact that someone in a that you know, a rock album beat an R&B album. Mm -hmm. It's funny. He says also later on, uh, because what happens is uh, you when you keep on diminishing art and not respecting the craft and smacking people in their face after delivering monumental feats of music, you're disrespectful to, to inspiration. Hello, <laughs> hypocrisy 101. Morning phase. I mean, I mean, he's, I mean, he's getting on to Beck, who was super nice and gracious and, you know, Totally took it, like, super well. Um, and, you know, when you keep on diminishing art, what's Kanye doing? He's diminishing art. He's not respecting Beck's work. He's smacking people, he's smacking Beck in the face after he delivered a monumental feat of music. I mean, he, he's guilty of the very thing that he is, he's criticizing Beck for. Definitely. Yeah, it, it's really, it's really, really funny. And then, it, like, when he's talking about, like, the, the show's produce then they, the, the show's producers, uh, do this whole promotional event. They'll run the music over someone's speech to the artist because they want commercial advertising. Um, there wasn't much commercial value to be had in Beck's nomination. Not at all. Like, again, he didn't sell very well. So if, like, this comment just doesn't even make sense. Like, And talking about running music over someone's speech, that's there to preserve prevent. showtime. I mean, if someone's standing up there talking for five minutes... That's going to ruin the entire channel's lineup. Right. So, I mean, while it sucks sometimes when someone can't finish their speech, I mean, it's runtime. They have to respect runtime. And that's not promotional. That's not commercial advertising. That's just basic TV. Mm -hmm. And then he's, he closes it out like, you know, I've got my wife, my daughter, my clothing line, so I'm not going to put my daughter at risk, but I'm here to fight for creativity. Are you? 
I'm like, are you really? I, I think. I, I mean, think that's a very disingenuous statement yeah, on this part. And Kanye just has such a big head, such a big ego, and I mean, I've never even once thought that he was fighting for creativity. Now, back in the day when he was first coming out, you know, first being a good new artist, I liked him. No, he wasn't bad. Like, Heartless is probably the last song I heard by him that I was like, okay, this is good. After that, he just got bloated and is like, I'm Jesus, basically. Yeah, I mean, he thinks he is a god complex. I mean, that's an understatement, too, I think. I mean, he's... He pro. I mean... Which is why he thinks he's got the credibility to, like, go on stage and, like, attempt to usurp the whole yeah. thing. And another quote by him, I can't remember when he said this, but he's like, there's 20, 30, 40, 50 characters in the Bible. Don't you think I'd be a character in a modern day Bible? I don't think that was him who said that. No, it was him. Really? I'm pretty sure it was. I don't think so. I don't think so. But anyway, like, yeah, so he's, this is like hypocrisy 101. Mm-hmm. And this is, uh, I mean, it's just amazing, like the extent that he was willing to go to dis. To diss a respectable choice and an even respectable win for album of the year. And here's the thing, like, it looked like Beyonce took it fine. Like Yeah, like when Kanye walked up, you could see her voice like, Oh no, not this again. Then he came off and she started laughing, probably also thinking like everyone else thought that he was joking. Yeah, but he wasn't. He he was being dead serious. If it had been a joke, I would have laughed. Like mm-hmm. I, I probably would have laughed. I would Which, have thought I mean, I did laugh. I thought it was hilarious because in the moment I thought he was joking. Yeah, I mean we thought like, okay, you know, he's just making, you know, a reference to something prior and he's laughing about it, whatever. Okay, that's funny. But he's not. He was dead serious. And good to him. I, I mean, we gotta at least give him credit that he didn't like actually interrupt the award. Yeah. That that was good, but still. If he would have, then maybe he's like ban Kanye from the Grammys from then on because if you do something like that twice that's not I mean the first time was bad enough but if he would have gone through a second time that's just not good at all well the first time I think it was the VMAs uh oh yeah yeah it was because he was talking about how good Beyonce's music video was over Taylor Swift and then Taylor Swift like looked like she was about to just break down and start bawling on stage which surprisingly enough Taylor Swift and Kanye West are now working on music together yeah which Okay, you know, good on them. You know, they're able to put that behind them and, you know, are, are, are working together and maybe something that will come out of it musically. But, yeah, so, wow, we are, uh, we're, we're running pretty good. So let's, uh, in closing, like the Grammy talks, like we promise no more Grammys after this episode. Uh, we'll, we'll stay away from the Grammys for a while. Um, it was a good, it was a good performance. It was a really good show. I liked it. I mean, you, you liked it. We're, we were satisfied with the nominations and the awards this year. Um, what's the takeaway from this though, is the question. Hmm. What's, what's the takeaway from the Grammys this year? Uh, I think the main takeaway, at least for me is if what they did this year continues, then it seems that maybe true artistry is starting to make a comeback. It, it's, it's definitely not here. It's got a long way to go. It's, yeah, it does. But I'm hoping that with what they did with the Grammys this year, that they'll actually start to become more respectable and not just a popularity contest. I think that trend will be justified if if next year. Yeah, uh, we have to see what happens in next year in order to confirm that. But I have, I'm crossing my fingers and I hope that that's what's going to happen. Yeah, I'm hoping that as well. And I'm really thankful that this year uh, was devoid of any like significant, con- like, I mean, we talked about the most controversial thing of the Grammys. It wasn't like uh, the 2014 Grammys where they had, you know, this mass uh, marriage ceremony on or stage. the year before when they had what looked like a demonic possession. That was 2012. 2012, yeah. Um, so, I mean, this year was relatively not controversial, and it was enjoyable. I mean, I, I mean, yes, the viewership suffered, which means that they're probably going to have, you know, to do something shocking next year to, to get that back up. But, I mean, I think the takeaway is uh, there, there's so many angles to take away this take a, to take away from this, but... Yeah, I think the biggest one, is, at least as far as the Grammys go, is that um, maybe maybe this is the start of a trend. Maybe it's not. Maybe this is just going to be an anomaly. But for what it was worth, it was a good night. Yeah, anomaly. Burp. Burp. I see what we did there. Um, but yeah, and with that, uh, 2015 Grammys are done. So uh, let's, we need to start closing this out, closing this show out. So Brett, you got any... Uh, you got any recos for this for this week? I have a reco and a disreco. Okay, go for it. The disreco is Shiner Birthday Chocolate Cake Stout. I have never tasted something so, at least as far as beer goes, I mean, 
I get what they were going for, but ugh. I mean, it basically tastes like you're drinking a stale chocolate cake. I mean, the flavor itself isn't like terrible, but when it's I'm so drinking strong, yeah, when I'm drinking beer, I want at least a little small profile of what a beer normally tastes like. But I drink this, I'm like, it tasted like a chocolate cake drink. Yes, I mean, and it was just weird. I don't want to drink a chocolate cake. Yeah, that's the thing is I don't want to drink a chocolate cake. I mean, I took like two sips of it and then poured it out. I was just like, this is gross. I mean, when I drank it, it was one of those things where I was, you know, hanging out with friends. One guy brought a six pack of this beer and I've sort of been influencing him to become a fellow beer snob and it's been working a beer, so far. A beer, a craft beer critic. Craft beer critic, okay. And he, you know... He introduced me to a couple of different beers that I hadn't tasted before, and I'd approve of them. And then with this, I wound up drinking the whole thing because he was sitting right across from me. He brought it to us all for free, so I was being nice about it. But, I mean, I was just like, ugh. Right. And then my Reco, um, there's – I'm sort of – iffy to call it an anime just because it's not japanese but rooster teeth has a series out called ruby spelled r-w-b-y mm-hmm. and i watched the first volume of it on netflix which is an hour and a half long and it was pretty dang good the guy who i was telling you about who recently passed away he was the main guy of, of ruby yeah oh wow yeah dang i mean the animation is kind of weird i mean you have to get used to it but still overall really good and i mean it's rated tvpg there's not really much language there's no sexuality at least that i could pick up on it was just a really good fun show Mm -hmm. and yeah it was good i am going to reco lint um because ash wednesday like belly button lint no like the holiday or like the the, the christian uh, the christian holiday lint yeah i'm gonna recommend the protestant version of lint where uh we do not observe lint because we uh, are required to or because we are uh it's something that we necessarily have to do but it's something that we want to do it's something optional uh you don't have to observe it if you don't want to but what lent is is a time of preparation and focus for easter where you fast from something uh i'm not going to tell you what i'm fasting from uh, just because it's not necessary, and uh, you fast from something that you want that that is costly, something that's going to uh, you're going to have to battle from. It's not like fasting from homework if you're a student, or fasting from work if you're an employee, but um, fasting from something you enjoy. And in that fasting, uh, you focus on uh, Christ, and you focus on the preparation for for Resurrection Sunday for for Easter of this year. And so, yeah, that's what I'm going to recommend. And uh, I know that my church is doing Ash Wednesday on. Uh, later this week and so i'm looking forward to that so yeah that, that would be my reco and yeah ash wednesday for the win Whew, yeah we definitely need to wrap this up so uh yeah we always like to take time to, to mention the gospel at the end of each episode and uh the gospel is uh definitely something that we have a lot has a lot in common with the grammys where uh our ultimate worship is found in something and uh, some of the artists at the Grammys are worshiping the award. They're, a worship, they're worshiping the title. Um, but uh, the gospel changes what we worship from temporary success and temporary uh, praise, and it changes the object of our worship to the God who created us and to the God who went to great and amazing lengths to save us. And so when we as Christians put our hope and put our ultimate trust in something other than God, uh, we are engaging in idolatry and we are, we are engaging in sin. And we're all sinners. Uh, all of us are sinners and all of us need a savior. And so we as Christians believe that the gospel is uh, is very relevant to the Grammys in that in the sin of chasing after an award or chasing after something uh, with our whole lives and putting it as the highest uh, value for our lives, uh, we're doing so at the expense of God and Christ came to remedy that and the gospel that we believe in is the gospel we think is very relevant to the Grammys. So now we're really, really done with the Grammys this year. Yes. Now we're really, really done with the Grammys this year. And... Uh, yeah, so let's start closing this out. Let's start wrapping this up. Um, Brett, we didn't tell people how they could uh, how they can get in contact with us, did we? Now, should we tell them our phone numbers? Uh, no, that might okay. be a little too creepy. Um, if you want to contact us, you can find us on Facebook at Another Ascending Lark. You can search us on Twitter at AAL Blog. Or you can send us an email at anotherascendinglark at gmail.com. And, of course, uh, if you want to check out the new anotherascendinglark.com, we'll have the show notes for this particular show with all of our new, with all of the articles that we mentioned, uh, new reviews, new articles coming. I mean, it's definitely a pretty cool place to go. I kind of like it. So you should definitely, definitely go there. Um, and yeah, 
Next week, we'll be back with Art in the Bible. Hopefully, we'll have some some more reviews. Uh, I don't think we'll have anything controversial next week as far as reviews go. Maybe not. Unless, you know, someone drops another surprise album, you know. Yeah. But then that would just start to get old. It's just be like, another one? Stop it. Stop it. Just start releasing albums like normal. I mean, I like surprise albums. Don't get me wrong. But uh, we don't want it to become a novelty. In what a if sense. it wound up becoming to where no longer were albums announced, but they're all just dropped randomly? Well, first of all, that'd be really hard to pull off in two. That would be so annoying. Yes, it would. <laughs> because we wouldn't be able to plan anything. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to plan anything. Y'all have a great, great week. We will see you back here uh, same time next week.